Good morning, everyone. Come on, you can do better than that. Good morning. You're not in the Pentagon if you work there. So we're gonna jump in. I'm Lieutenant General Retired Leslie Smith. I'm the Vice President for Leadership and Education here at AUSA. And for our, our first speaker, uh, we got the, the powerhouse here, Mac McCurry. Uh, the reason why he's smiling so much is because he doesn't work in the Pentagon anymore. He's down at the Army Aviation Center of Excellence where he brings all the pieces and parts together. I ran into Mac, I think he was a Colonel or one star, I can't remember, because we all just run around the building. But he's done all those jobs from platoon leader to commanding at every level and spent a lot of time in the building. So please join me in a round of applause for Mac McCurry. General Smith and General Brown don't don't need the block back here, but Mr. Bush, <laughs> Mr. Bush and I are thankful. Um, Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, great to be here this morning in our nation's capital, seeing so many familiar faces from my time uh, walking the halls of the Pentagon and on Capitol Hill. And, and uh, I can tell you, having been the, uh, the CG at Fort Rucker for about seven months now and, and the 17th Aviation Branch Chief, I'm really happy to be just visiting this time. Uh, it's an honor to, to see General Brown and follow Mr. Bush this morning as we kick off another AUSA event after almost four years of, of not doing this. So it's great to see everybody in the big room again. Uh, these leaders, General Brown and Mr. Bush, two, two gentlemen that have spent their entire professional lives in service to our nation. Uh, so thank you. Um, I also wanna recognize the six pack. You know, we are on, uh, we're in three theaters right now, the six pack. So we're kind of forward, forward stationed and deployed right now. I've got my battle buddy, uh, General, uh, Major General Hank Taylor here today. I think uh, Major General Tom O'Connor will, will, will come in a bit later. And we've got uh, General Rugen out in the Indo-Pacific and a couple of our special operations reps in Europe right now. Uh, so we're, we're trying to cover the whole force. Uh, so today, although we brought in the Army Acquisition Executive early on, uh, as we look at the theme of the event, 40th anniversary Army Aviation, uh, you know, recognizing the past and into the future, uh, today the panels are mostly focused on training and sustainment as we move forward. Great opportunity to come together to talk about what we've done and where we want to go. Uh, the agenda is packed with great influential leaders, as you heard from industry. Uh, some of our, our retired general officers, uh, General Quinlan's out here somewhere, you know. So uh, both General Ta both Lieutenants Taylor and McCurry worked for General Quinlan uh, in the past, so you can blame him uh, for a lot of this stuff. Uh, but thanks for establishing uh, establishing such an August group to talk today, sir. Uh, as the Army Aviation Branch Chief, I have the distinct responsibility to generate, train, develop aviation soldiers and leaders of today and in the future. And as the force mod proponent, I'm charged with modernizing the branch by synchronizing the doctrine, training, operational concepts, sustainment policy, and facilities surrounding the big material. Uh, for me, this is more than just a professional responsibility. It's somewhat personal. Uh, I have two daughters, a son and a son-in-law serving in the Army today in infantry, armor, cavalry, and aviation formations around the world. So while two of those uh, kids, I call them kids, two of those uh, young folks out there fly Apache helicopters, the more important part is the other two are on the ground. So as both a father and a leader, I know what aviation provides the soldier on the ground, and I'm all in on working to keep us the best trained, equipped, and led aviation force in the world. Uh, we talked about 40th anniversary. This year, 12th of April, 1983, 40 years ago, the, the anniversary of Army Aviation as a separate branch of the combat arms. Uh, coincidentally, also the 50th anniversary of the end of the Vietnam War. January 27th, 1973, Paris Peace Accords were signed. Uh, so we are putting a big effort uh, in the aviation branch into recognizing our Vietnam veterans. And I'd ask you all to give a round of applause to all the Vietnam veterans in the audience today. You know, we trained 40,000 helicopter pilots through the aviation branch and Fort Rucker during Vietnam. We had 12,000 helicopters. Today, we have about 3,600 combat helicopters. We had 12,000 to put, it, put that scale into, uh, in, into scope. Um, as we modernize and transform 
we can reach further in the future because we stand on the shoulders of these giants, those that came before us. Folks like Major General Retired Rudy Ostovich, our third aviation branch chief who's in the audience today. Uh, he's always there for me, as are all the former aviation branch chiefs. They all offer to help routinely and give me lots of, lots of uh, guidance. You know, Army Aviation's roamed the skies as part of the land component since we first broke friction with the ground with tethered balloons. In 1861, President Lincoln was so impressed with Professor Thaddeus Lowe sending him a telegram from 500 feet above the White House that he appointed him the first aeronaut of the Union Army Balloon Corps, 1861. In fact, we just recently changed the call sign at Fort Rucker to align more with that heritage. And the new call sign at Fort Rucker is Intrepid, named after uh, Thaddeus Lowe's balloon. And, uh, you know, the definition's pretty cool too, bold intrinsic action. That's kind of like aviation, right? So we see this innovation between industry and army leadership over and over again. And that's what we're all about here today. We saw it again when Lieutenant Selfridge was flying with Orville Wright right here at Fort Myer with the Wright Flyer and, and, and the first heavier than air flying machines. Uh, this, this type of collaboration propelled Army Aviation to be the original multi-domain solution for the ground commander. During World Wars I, II, and Korea, commanders began to be able to see further, to strike targets, strategic bombing, move critical supplies and medevac, our wounded, and extend command and control. That's what we're about in Army Aviation. We're about see, strike, move, and extend for the ground commander and the soldier on the ground. In large part, that was, that was possible because of the titans of industry who produced military equipment on a scale never before seen and, and really not seen since World War II. You know, after Korea, as we explored these concepts, we took uh, General Hamilton House and the work of the, of the Air Mobility Board to explore what became Air Mobile Operations, later Air Assault, and, and through these Cold War industry partnerships and, and that work, you and industry brought us the Cobra, the Huey, and, and many other platforms that helped us in direct fire, air assault, and medevac over the years. You know, uh, we say history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. In the years following Vietnam, we were coming out of uh, many years of counterinsurgency fighting. We were trying to find a way to sustain an all-volunteer force. We were updating our professional military education, building a non-commissioned officer corps, updating our combat training centers, and industry partnered with us once again to develop new technologies and platforms to help us operate on an extended battlefield outnumbered by our foes. Kind of sounds like today. By delivering the Big Five, Apache and Black Hawk, Bradley Abrams, and the Patriot, the Army transitioned to air land battle under the leadership of General Starry, Meyer, and DePue. The Big Five transformed how we fought. In the deserts of Kuwait and Iraq during Desert Storm, it paid off. And over 20 years of sustained combat in Afghanistan and Iraq, these platforms did what we needed them to do for soldiers. As we reflect back on this past, there's one common thing that military aviation shares all the way up from the aeronauts of the Balloon Corps to right now today. And that's the sacred trust we have to the soldier on the ground. As Simon Sinek says, all organizations have to understand their why. Well, our why is that soldier on the ground. Army aviation doesn't exist for any other reason. It was the same 162 years ago, and it will be the same in future generations. Today, we find ourselves at another inflection point, shifting from that counterinsurgency stability into multi-domain operations in large-scale combat against peer or near-peer competition. Uh, you know, there's been times where we face this extended battle battlefield in scope, and we have to train to fight outnumbered and sustain the volunteer force again. Army aviation operating in the lower tier of the air domain is critical to the survivability of the combined arms team and the joint force. As a young leader growing up in the army, many leaders, Generals Perkins and Helmick, two of them said, Mac, I know the combined arms team is more effective and more survivable when army aviation is in the air. That's what we mean when we say above the best. Today, we're applying recent observations from uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, the ongoing operations in Europe, and our knowledge in the Indo-Pacific to update doctrine and training programs at Fort Rucker to ensure we have the competitive advantage necessary to fight and win in the next war. We're changing how we fight and what we fight with. We're making significant changes in organization for aviation in the Army of 2030 and 2040 and beginning to explore concepts into the 2050s. 
We're updating the doctrine to once again focus on aviation supporting the division as the unit of action. Gone are the days of stacking air weapons teams for 24 hour coverage and flying ring routes between Bagram and Kandahar or Balad and Baghdad. We're relooking aviation force structure to tailor combat aviation brigades to their division missions, where we give a little more punch to heavy divisions and we give a lot more mobility to light divisions. You know, that allows us to rapidly mass converge effects, rapidly disperse for survivability on an on a increasingly lethal battlefield. We're modernizing our officer and warrant officer PMA to develop leaders of character who are also experts at combined arms maneuver. And we're moving forward with more advanced live virtual and constructive training. Through all this, we will continue targeted modernization on our current fleets of Black Hawk, Apache, Chinook, Gray Eagle to support the combined arms team in the immediate future. Army Aviation is well positioned in our new doctrine. In October, we released the new Army Operations 3.0 for multi-domain operations. We operate across, across all warfighting functions. And it's time where we adapt and change to prepare for the next potential conflict against any adversary with capability and capacity filling our critical large-scale combat operation gaps. We're doing that by developing and testing new platforms, systems to fight across all domains. We'll influence land, sea, and air with the interoperability to fight as a joint force and in coalitions with our allies and partners. You know, paragraph, uh, 1-93 through 1-96 in in, uh, in 3 talks about the domains and specifically lays out the air domain and talks about Army Aviation's contribution to the ground maneuver and joint force in the lower tier of the air domain. And then in paragraph 2-68, we talk about the interdependence of the domains and how from the lower tier of the air domain, Army Aviation is critical to that ground force commander. The capability and capacity for combined arms maneuver teamed with long range fires is pivotal to the success of our divisions as the unit of action and also integral to penetrating and disintegrating enemy air defense systems and layers. The long range air launched effects and long range precision munitions uh, with FARA extend the reach and lethality of Army aviation. The long range assault will provide power projection from relative sanctuary with increased speed, range, endurance, and sustainability over the current fleet with, to uh, help our ability to extend operational reach over water and across long distances that's particularly viable in the Indo-Pacific. This would also reduce the heavy demand that Army Aviation currently puts on strategic airlift. Future tactical UAS will not be tethered to an airfield or operated from ground control stations, allowing soldiers to control while maneuvering using a scalable, controllable interface is important to us. You know, as a as the aviation branch chief, I look at uh, spaces, you know, force structure all the time. And one of the things that I look at is we have Apache companies that are just over 30 people, and we have Gray Eagle companies that are 135 people. So how do we make better use of the 135 people in unmanned formations. It's kind of a paradox that my un, our unmanned formations are larger than our manned formations in aviation. So how do we do that? We do it by getting rid of fixed ground control stations, bringing scalable control, controllable interface to bear, not being dependent on runways and other equipment, which drives requirements for trucks and trailers. So you have to have drivers and TCs. And now we can use, we can greater harness the power of those people to synthesize that great amount of data coming at us through all of these systems that you all are producing out in, out in the industry. Let me talk about MOSA a little bit. MOSA also critical to rapidly integrating future capabilities. Mr. Bush talked about it uh, also in, in reacting to rapidly evolving threats. We have to be able to plug and play at the speed of technology. All of that together enables convergence of effects at the operational and theater strategic levels. In these efforts, we'll leverage advanced and emerging technologies to maximize human machine teaming to realize the, bra the branch's path to autonomy. Today, we can't do all mission tasks uncrewed or autonomously. However, we should strive to make first contact with unmanned systems. Shame on us if we don't. We have the nation's treasure, the sons and daughters of the American people in our hands. So if we have the ability to make contact with unmanned first, we should, we should do it. The human machine teaming is evolving. 
And as technology becomes more advanced, we'll be able to do more. Uh, there's a recent MITRE study that just came out, uh, asked them to rack and stack the 123 mission tasks that an air cavalry squadron has to do in reconnaissance forward of a, of a moving force. Uh, today, we can't do that autonomously. That's what the study determined. And probably not in 2040 either. Uh, but we're making progress. And really, it's the areas of perception, decision-making, and natural language processing that are inherent in our human brains that we have to continue to advance in this space. Right now, we will continue to use our unmanned systems teamed with man to do those dull, dirty, and dangerous tasks, the ones where we need persistence, where I have to watch a, a specific spot, piece of terrain, uh, or a specific target for long periods of time, where... It's a, a dangerous environment to put humans in. Maybe it's contaminated chemically or radiologically, uh, or, or the threat is high and we wanna penetrate first with the unmanned. That's what we're trying to do with this teaming. And as we advance in those other areas I just discussed, we will evolve our look on autonomy. Army's collaboration with industry is essential to meet these requirements and put the right equipment and capability in soldiers' hands. Overall, it's an exciting time to be a part of Army aviation. Events like this are an excellent opportunity to draw out the next Thaddeus Lowe or Orville Wright. And as we transform and foster innovation between the Army, Army aviation and industry, I'm optimistic for the future. That as we continue to evolve, we will continue to be the multi-domain solution for the combined arms team and uphold that sacred trust with the soldier on the ground. When I'm out talking to soldiers and our, our aviators, our flying soldiers, I tell them, look, when that soldier on the ground needs to know what's over the next hill, we're going to go find out. When they need a little more firepower, we're going to bring it. When they need to be put in a position of relative advantage or need extra beans, bullets, water, we're going to put them there. And God forbid they're laying on the field of battle wounded, we're going to go get them. That's our why. That's why we've existed. That's why we exist today, and that's why we exist tomorrow. We'll continue to uphold the sacred trust. Army strong, above the best. I'll take questions if we have time. Hi, sir. Hey, Sydney. Good to see you. Uh, you know, we're, you talked about the lessons learned we're incorporating from Ukraine, which is obviously a very deadly air defense environment, uh, Nagor Karabakh and other places. You know, how is the are the skill sets changing? I mean. When you were fresh, uh, you know, fresh, freshly commissioned, there wasn't the same amount of electronics on the on the aircraft. There wasn't the man on man teaming. Uh, you know, there wasn't the you know the prominence of software in just how you operate uh, the machines. How is that changing the way you need to train people and the way you need to keep everything? You know, not just tactically but technologically uh, responsive to changing threats. Yeah, thanks, Sydney. Thanks for that question. Uh, you know, true. I flew. I flew an un unarmed OH-58 Charlie in Desert Storm. You know, so there wasn't a lot of high tech uh, in, in that cockpit. Uh, you know, especially when the when the aerial observer let the map go out the door. Uh, but uh, you know, we uh, we. <laughs> it's a great question, and one of the things as a branch chief that I look at is knowledge, skills, and attributes of our leaders. Uh, so uh, you know, we've we've evolved kind of how we do branching in the army and and as a the guy that kind of manages that for army aviation where we used to do straight oml based branching we now look at knowledge skills and attributes we have opportunities to engage west point cadets and rotc cadets multiple times as they're exploring what branches they want to apply for uh, and, and we even go through a series of video interviews uh, with a panel uh, and, and look at those things so that's one thing uh, multitasking always been important in aviation. You had to be able to see the battlefield from the ground commander's perspective and be able to describe it to him and 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 take the initiative and and you know maneuver. Uh, even more important when you have this you know massive amount of data coming at you. So that's another area where I think we we employ as we look at machine learning, the advance of artificial intelligence. How can we offload crews? How can I take that? young warrant officer sitting in the front seat of the age 64 with all of this data coming at him and help him what tasks you know that are routine tasks can we offload from that crew member to make him a more efficient fighter on the battlefield to support that soldier on the ground so hopefully that answers your question Cindy. go ahead 
sir. Hey, Mac, I can certify that you're a well-trained OH-58A pilot uh, <laughs> since I pinned your wings on those many years ago. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, talk about the Army as a maneuver force and aviation as a component part of all that. Uh, we're Some of us were with you last month and heard some great presentations by Army leaders. I'm uh, reminded that General Beagle, who used to command the 10th, now at CAC, um, made the comment that our aviation brigade and division artillery will be the key forces at division going forward. And uh, General Rainey, who will be speaking here, I guess, uh, pretty soon, um, made similar kind of comments about uh, the aviation imp impact on the Army. Uh, vertical, we're in the vertical envelopment business, he says, which is so true. And he said the Army aviation, the 2040 area, CAB, probably the most valuable brigade and division. With all that as a background, how are we training our aviation brigade commanders primarily at Fort Rucker to command combined arms forces? I know, yes, we are providing, our aviation brigade commanders do a wonderful job doing what you're saying, support the ground soldier. But we're entering into a phase now where we have long range precision fires and we're gonna have high speed, long range assault aircraft. We're gonna be involved with a lot of movement and a lot of fires in depth. And those forces that are gonna take advantage of that technology are gonna be combined arms forces, not just aviation, but forces commanded by aviation officers potentially with infantry and armor as part of their task force. Are we training our officers in the aviation branch? as brigade commanders to be combined arms leaders? Thanks, sir. Thanks for that question. So I think, uh, you know, it, we have we have to start younger. By the time by the time I was a brigade commander, you know, I've got like a pre-command touch point with them and we got war fighters uh, in support of divisions and corps. And so the first thing we've done is we've gone in and updated PME across the COEs, so more than Fort Rucker with Fort Benning and with Fort Sill and, and uh, Fort Leonard Wood and others uh, to make sure we have we are using common scenarios as we discuss and plan operations. Uh, and, and I'm working with uh, my good friend, uh, General Buzzard, General, Major General Curtis Buzzard at Fort Benning. We're always talking about ways to be tighter. Another thing we do uh, is we are using the same training scenario, it happens to be a wet gap scenario, we're using the same scenario at our pre-command at Fort Rucker when we're with the when we're with the colonels uh, on a on a Saturday. By the way, uh, training them. We're using the same scenario that we use at ASEPC with the two-star commanders before they take command. So we're trying to build this common baseline of discussion. You know, uh, doctrine's a huge part. Um, you know, we kind of got on autopilot during uh, during the last 20 years with AWTs, SWTs, two two ship ring routes, um, and and small unit operations. And we talked, you know, we didn't talk a lot of, you know, forms of contact and types of maneuver and, and all that thing. Uh, and so we're getting back to that. I've told my doctrine chief, your measure of success is when I'm out at a warfighter and some high speed major lieutenant colonel who's trying to plan something walks in and he starts just talking doctrine and he walks out and they go oh you know holy cow who's that guy and i said that was, they say that was our army aviator so that's our measure but we got to start young we got to get there and then the commonality of scenarios from captain all the way through colonel gets us to those warfighter exercises at the division and corps level zach rosenberg james uh, you've talked about manned unmanned teaming. I'm wondering if you can elaborate on what that means from an equipment perspective and from an acquisition perspective and from a pilot training perspective for that matter. Yeah, good question. I'm not sure I'm the right guy to talk acquisition perspective, but I'll talk about, uh, you know, where we've been a little bit and, and where we go. You know, a good, a good friend of mine, retired general officer who remained nameless right now, told me one time uh, uh, when I was a colonel that we talked a good game on man to man teaming, but we didn't do it very well. Uh, and, and one of the reasons was that we didn't invest early on. So for instance, in our age 64s, we needed upper and lower receivers to train with unmanned systems. We weighted all of those in theater. So uh, guys like Terry Horner back there that were training Apache units, you know, he had 24 aircraft, but only two of them had upper and lower receivers you know, and probably one of those was in maintenance. So that means you had one aircraft in a squadron to train manned unmanned at home station, which means you probably weren't doing a lot of it, right? 
Uh, and so what happened is Eunice would rotate into theater. They would suddenly have this equipment that they didn't know how to use. And they were, they, they had a learning curve. And then a couple months in, they'd figure it out and they'd be pretty good at it. And then the next unit would come in and rotate and have the learning curve again. So to avoid that, I think, you know, my good, my, my wingman and, and good friend Wally Rugen, he's done a great job with the CFT at making sure that, that our tactical UAS out there are a part of the aviation plan and not an adjunct, not something we added on later. And as we talk about FARA, we talk about the FARA ecosystem and launched effects and how we deliver those, you know, into the basket and they go out and provide that battlefield information back that we can use to make decisions and, and, and address targets. So I think from an operational perspective, that's kind of how I see it. From a training perspective, you know, we work really hard now with our, uh, in our PME. So we've adjusted our warrant officer PME to, uh, we have an advanced warfighting skills class now that has replaced uh, kind of our, what was our uh, warrant officer advance course. So they now focus on completely on tactical operations and how to bring manned and unmanned teams. And in every one of their scenarios, it's not just helicopters, it's helicopters and unmanned systems working together to, to gather that information for the commander. Hey, sir, how you doing? Uh, Ryan Scott, had a quick question for you. Uh, as I left, you know, battalion command, there were two things that I really uh, focused on for my young leaders that were coming up beyond being tactically sound and knowing our doctrine. It, and this, I think, applies to the comments you made as we start tailoring our divisions to nest with those uh, aviation capabilities to nest with the division capabilities. But the two areas that were uncompromised for us, especially we look at the CTCs and more importantly, training at home was our ability to move our equipment with the ground, our ground forces that we're supporting, and our ability to talk to on the communications piece. So from your lens now, as you look across the aviation force, and as you look at now, we're at the 40 year anniversary in April, where we're going next, do you think we're moving, do, are we getting it right now? And are we moving in the right direction in those particular areas? And hopefully that makes sense, sir. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. I, I think two things, I think now, uh, and by now, I kind of mean in the last five years, we are getting units out in the field more, you know, collective training where you actually have to try to move all your stuff and figure out what you have to move and, and what doesn't move or what gets moved later. Uh, so we're doing a lot, of a lot more of that out in the operational force today for the now piece. For the future piece, uh, we are working on that and thinking about it. And then what reason I say that is when I talk about aviation formations operating in the future, uh, it's not what we saw in the last 20 years. It's not cabs sitting on concrete airfields. It's platoons and companies dispersed in the wood line. And so that brings on a whole new set of challenges for Army aviation. How do you sustain that force? What's the training level of your force? How many special tools do you have, which drives how many vehicles do you need? All of that is what we're doing with our concept work looking forward. Uh, because, you know, uh, for Army Aviation, I got to be able to get the helicopters and the, and the unmanned systems in the fight. And so this greater reach operating from standoff uh, and, and accounting for the long range fires of the threat is important. Sir, good morning. Thanks for being here. Uh, Jeff Sorensen. And, and this, this question is more along the lines of requirements because you are, at the end of the day, the aviation requirement um, definer, if you will. So, you know, we heard Secretary Bush talk about the middle tier acquisition policy, which I think was a great idea, having spent time in acquisition. My success was all about bringing soldiers from the field to come in and sort of advise companies on how to build systems that they eventually were going to execute with. At the same point in time, though, we have had in the past issues where we have allowed prototypes to get developed and we could never bring them to bear to completion. Prime example, Comanche. It was a prototype, a prototype, continued to evolve, continued to evolve, became unaffordable, we had to cancel the program. So now with this acquisition middle tier policy, what are you doing as the requirements definer to ensure that the good idea fairies don't continue to manipulate the requirements such that we don't get systems that are unaffordable or that we can't scale and get them developed and fielded. Yeah, thanks, sir. So I think um, 
you know, Mr. Bush talked a little bit about it, about informing requirements. So before, uh, if General Rugen was looking at a material requirement and, and, and we talk in the, in the schoolhouse and we're, we're, you know, setting the bar and we set unobtainium for in, industry because, you know, our imaginations were bigger than, than what was real, uh, or sometimes our imaginations were bigger than, than our stomachs or our wallets, uh, things continued to get pushed, right? We'd say, oh, well, in two years, if I, if I just wait two years, I can, have, I can add this into it. And then, well, now I can add that thing into it. And I think all of us, you know, um, across all of the modernization efforts, we have to have this sessions like today where we're collaborating with industry and we see, hey, this is what I want to do. And industry comes back and says, you know, here's where we are today with technology. This is what's in the realm of possible. You know, in five years, this is our best guess of where we will be and a balance between those things and then holding the line and getting something into production first is is important to me as a requirements uh, person. How do we hold the line and then get something to production? You know, the H64 Echo V6, you know, that we're fielding in, in some quantity right now is nothing like the H64 Alpha. But if we hadn't got the alpha, we wouldn't have the Echo V6. Hopefully that answers it, sir. Any other questions? Let's give General McCurry a big round of applause. <laughs>